now reach part two of our mega reification to Gavin Nortwood. Now, again, for people that may be wondering and saying, William, uh, when are you going to deal with the actual scripture and the fathers, he quotes, we've dealt with the scripture. And we're dealing with the positive evidence in the fathers. Will we deal with the positive evidence as well? Um, actually, excuse me, will we also deal with the evidence of the fathers he presented by refuting the claims he has made? Without a doubt, we're going to deal with that. That will be probably the final session. These are multiple parts, remember? Our goal is for this to be the most comprehensive refutation of Gavin's material. So we're going to deal with everything, including a full session just on Elvira. I am unaware of anyone having done as much detail work as we are going to do and present on the Council of Elvira. We'll have one of the top foremost scholars in the world talking about Elvira, talking about Canon 36, and it'll be a ton of fun. We're going to have a blast. But let's get on with St. Gregory of Nyssa. Anytime you encounter St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, St. Basil the Great. You have the Cappadocian greats, the great defenders of the doctrine of the Trinity. So when you have them also defending the proper utilization of icons of images, uh, and they are as magnificent a patristic witness as they are fantastic defenders of orthodoxy, of the Trinitarian faith, that is really something you have to really focus on. God's temple is brightly adorned with magnificence and is embellished with decorations. Pictures of animals, which masons have fashioned, with delicate silver figures. It exhibits images of flowers made in the likeness of the martyr's virtues, his struggles, sufferings, the various savage actions of tyrants and souls, that fiery furnace, the athlete's blessed consummation, and the human form of Christ presiding over all these events. They are like a book skillfully interpreting by means of colors which express the martyr's struggles and glorify the temple with resplendent beauty. Hmm. These spectacles, Strike the sense and delight the eye by drawing us near to the martyr's tomb. Incredible. Delight the eye by drawing us near to the martyr's tomb, which we believe to be both a sanctification and blessing. And if anyone takes dust from the martyr's resting place, it is a gift and a deserving treasure. Should a person have both the good fortune and permission to touch the relics, this experience is a highly valued prize and seems like a dream, both to those who were cured and whose wish was fulfilled. <clears throat> the body appears as it were alive and healthy. The eyes, mouth, ears, as well as the other senses are a cause for pouring out tears of reverence and emotion. In this way, one implores a martyr who intercedes on our behalf and is an attendant of God for imparting those favors and blessings which people seek that's awesome god's temple is brightly adorned now here is the other thing that we have to emphasize here if and it is the case if in the old testament god's temple was brightly adorned and it was with angelic carved angelic beings how much more so god's temple in the new testament it really does seem quite fitting and it really is properly emphasized by St. Gregory of Nyssa. Emphasize that. Now, we rewind a little bit to the great St. Clement of Alexandria. Now, when was the instructor written? Now, you, you have a number of scholars. I've seen some dated to the very late 100s, some to the early 200s. Um, what matters more than anything else is what St. Clement of Alexandria leader of the catechetical school of Alexandria, founded by St. Mark, what he has to tell us. If it is necessary for us, while engaged in public business or discharging other avocations in the country, 
and often away from our wife to seal anything for the sake of safety. He, Christ the Word, allows us a signet for this purpose only. Let our seals be either a dove, and we know the dove represents the Holy Ghost, or a fish, or a ship scudding before the wind, or a musical lyre, which Polycrates used, or a ship's anchor, which Selichus got engraved as a device. And if there be one fishing, he will remember the apostles. So this is to call to mind the apostles. This is to remember them. You don't call this honor and veneration? Of course it is. It is to bring to memory the apostle, the children drawn out of the water. For we are not to delineate the four faces of idols. So these are not idols. There's a difference between idols and between proper images, we who are prohibited to cleave to them, nor a sword, nor a, bow, nor a bow, following as we do peace, nor drinking cups, being temperate. But remember, even though I do mark it down as early 200s, if you can check even what if you want to call it liberal scholarship. But scholarship, by and large, will date this to being late 100s. So this is an incredible second century witness. I've got to emphasize that. Second century witness. Where he says, let our seals be either a dove or a fish. So there are seals. There are signets. There are images. St. Methodius of Olympus. By the way, this is preserved in the great St. John Damascene, and it is authentic. There is no doubt it is authentic. He says, <clears throat> for instance, then, the images of our kings here, even though they be not formed of the more precious materials, gold or silver, are honored by all. For men do not, while they treat with respect those of the far more precious material, slight those of a less valuable but to honor every image in the world, even though it be of chalk or bronze. And one who speaks against either of them is not acquitted as if he had only spoken against clay, nor condemned for having despised gold, but for having been disrespectful towards the king and Lord himself. The images of God's angels, which are fashioned of gold, the principalities and powers, we make to honor his we make to his honor and glory. This is the very point that I attempted to make, that I've attempted to make over and over from Ezekiel 41. And people will then question and say, well, where is the veneration? And where is, uh, we said that, where is it said that they're being venerated in Ezekiel 41? Uh, the very fact that angels, those of the divine court, are present in Ezekiel 41 is incredibly significant. Now, does it talk about people venerating them? Now, if we're going to talk about veneration of angels, we can find that in many other passages. But very clearly, they are there because they give honor and glory to God. If they're in God's temple, they are to give honor and glory to God. That is quite simple and clear. So St. Methodius of Olympus is very, very clear on this point. I think it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. I think it is very clearly evident in his writing. I think many people would be able to find uh, the very clear parallelism here. And now remember the one thing we brought out in part one, how when St. Paul talks about building with gold, silver, or precious metals, we have the very same language here. Precious materials, gold, silver. How did the one build the foundation? And that foundation being what would be indicative of whether or not that person would be saved or saved as through fire. Precious metals and you receive your reward. The precious metals in 1 Corinthians that St. Paul refers to as language reminiscent of Solomon's temple, adorned with incredible imagery, a gorgeous, beautiful temple, and very similar language found here in St. Methodius of Olympus, where it says the images of our king, sir, even though they be not formed of the more precious materials, gold or silver, are honored by all. Now, 
I know some people will say, well, images are given due respect. They are honored. And I'm not going to argue that. As a Catholic, you would be a little bit off if you argued that we don't respect or honor images themselves. But why do we honor images themselves? Is it because they have magical powers? No, because we cherish them. We treasure them like I would cherish a photo of my daughter, my beautiful little girl, because it reminds me of her. It calls to memory. The love I have for her, the great love I have for her, this is exactly what is laid out in Holy Writ. This is exactly what is laid out in the early church fathers. Very clearly what is being done in the Psalm, Psalm 137 or Psalm 138, depending on how you read it, where there is the bowing before the temple to give worship to the Lord because the temple represents God. Thus you are called to be reminded of that. And even though you bow to a uh, creation, to a temple, you are all the while on your mind calling to memory Yahweh. It's not idolatry. There is a healthy way to venerate, and uh, when we say venerate, rightly so, to offer dual you owe to the saints. We are to honor and serve one another in love, not to worship one another. It's a, the heart of the message is really is the heart of veneration of images and icons, it really is the veneration going to the one being represented, as we pointed out in part one so in depth, and we looked at the Council of Trent. Um, we would argue that such is evident as well. And the great St. Methodius of Olympus, a, a text you don't hear very often of, an important one though, <clears throat> St. Jerome's commentary on Jonah. And because it's a little tough to find at times, um, and at times a little bit uh, confusing to understand what is being spoken of here, but it's very clearly uh, talking about images in a positive context. It says, apparently he feared that if ivy were taken instead of gourds, that there would be not anything to drink in his secret place and his shade. And justly on the veins of this gourd, which are called salcomaria in general, by the way, this is talking about um, uh, likely chalices, drinkware, as multiple scholars have pointed out. It is customary to paint the image of the apostles from which this individual has borrowed his name, which is not his own. If it is this easy to change one's name after having been the, the Cornelii, seditious consuls, they renamed themselves Paul and Neil consuls. I asked myself, why in surprise? I should not be allowed to translate ivy instead of gourd. But this is important what he notes. Even though it's in passing, he notes that on the veins of this gourd, which are called salcomaria, in general, it is customary to paint the image of the apostles. And this is very clearly something spoken of in a positive way. <clears throat> customary to paint the image of the apostles. Why no criticism? Why is it not called idolatry by St. Jerome? Another great and magnificent defender of the Trinity. Remember the one who lamented that the world groaned to wake up and find itself Arian. And he was worried about that horrific Arian takeover. That great defender of the Orthodox Catholic faith the great and magnificent doctor of the church, St. Jerome. St. Augustine, in his controversy with the Manichaean, says, for Abraham to sacrifice his son of his own accord is shocking madness. His doing so at the command of God proves him faithful and submissive. This is so loudly proclaimed by the very voice of truth that Faustus, eagerly rummaging for some fault and reduced at last to slanderous charges, has not the boldness to attack this action. It is scarcely possible that he can have forgotten a deed so famous. What deed so famous? Abraham sacrificing his son, or the preparation of that, doing so at the command of God. He's then attacking Faustus, and he says that he couldn't have forgotten this famous deed. It recurs to the mind of itself without any study or reflection, and in so, and is in fact repeated by so many tongues 
and portrayed in so many places that no one could pretend to shut his eyes or his ears to it. It is pictured in so many places. That is literally what the Latin says, by the way. By the way, I briefly touch upon this when um, when I did my show of hands-on apologetics with the Master Gary. We briefly touched upon, um, I believe, I think we briefly touched upon the Latin. Uh, if we didn't, if I didn't in that show, I'll mention it now. It, it literally is talking about this uh, scene of sacred history being pictured in many places, portrayed in many places. You know, Faustus would have known about him. There are photos, there are paintings of this in so many places. St. Augustine speaks of that in a positive sense. In fact, he indicates that they're in so many places, so Faustus would have been aware of this. That is quite significant. That seems to be ignored. We don't. We rarely hear of this from St. Augustine. Seems to get passed over multiple times. St. Basil the Great. Oh, this is important because we're going to pause for a moment. There is a text that many Catholics and Orthodox and even Protestants have used in the past uh, his uh, letter, 360, which rightly so they've used and utilized as an authentic text of Basil. But modern day scholarship seems to not like the fact that it utilizes Theotokos. So modern day scholarship has moved in and said, this cannot be his. It cannot be his. It is not in the style of Basil's writing. Tha is an important text which talks about veneration of images and icons that are kissed and revered and viewed as precious is, is, is spurious, we're told. That's fine. There are other areas, including the one where Basil talks about the honor given to the portrait, going to the prototype. That's one. But there's this one as well that at times people don't even point towards. So if modern day scholarship wants to question the authenticity of letter 360 and modern day Protestants for their benefit and cause want to jump on that bandwagon, we will point them towards the homily and the 40 martyrs. And we'll do so by noting that he says, when often both historians and painters express manly deeds of war, the one embellishing them with words, the other engraving them on the tablets. So just like the, the, the Greek we find in Ezekiel 41, Geglumena of carving. This is speaking of engraving on the tablets, carvings. They both arouse many, too, to bravery. The facts which the historical accounts presents by being listened to, the painting silently portrays by imitation. In this very way, let us too remind those present. So he's saying in this way, also, like this, like in a painting, in a portrayal as well, we should be reminded of the 40 martyrs' virtue. As it were, by bringing their deeds to their gaze, let us motivate them to imitate those who are nobler and closer to them with respect to their course of life. Is this not directly saying, let us do this, let us imitate this in form of art, in painting? And doing so reminds one of the virtue of the 40 martyrs. You're directly giving them honor. They imitate those who are nobler and closer to them with respect to their course of life. This is directly venerating, venerating those great martyrs. You are giving veneration to them. The painting, the portrait is thus done to bring to mind their amazing virtue, giving honor to those martyrs. And we question our evangelical friends who argue that this is an accretion. This is late in history. You don't find it early on. It only comes into play at the Second Council of Nicaea. And by the way, the iconoclasts, had better arguments, made more sense. There were councils that were bigger in number with the iconoclasts. I will remind the audience that there were Aryan councils. Remini Salucha come to mind? 
that were greater in number than Nicaea. <laughs> greater in number does not make it correct in their theology at all. And we will find that the theology of the iconoclast, by the way, is nowhere even similar to the theology of modern-day Protestants. There's another issue we run into. Another massive problem we run into. I mean, goodness. Where do modern-day Protestantism, where, where do modern-day Protestants turn to for their ancient pedigree of the faith? I, I would argue that they don't have that ancient pedigree. Thus, they attempt to latch on to, at times, groups that don't even believe the way they believe, or at times, to just latch on to straight-out heretical groups. That you find often. You find that quite often. Because, as we've seen before from Gavin, um, latching on to beliefs that originated within uh, heterodoxy, this is a problem, a massive problem. St. John Chrysostomos, the golden mouthful, magnificent early church father. And it became so frequent that this name of St. Melidios echoed around from every direction, everywhere, both in side streets and in the marketplace and in fields and on highways. But you didn't experience so much just at the name, but even at the depiction of his body. Look at that. But you didn't experience so much just at the name, but even at the depiction of his body. At least what you did with names, this you practiced too. In the case of that man's image, for truly many carved that holy image on finger rings and on seals and on cups and on bedroom walls and all over the place so that one didn't just hear that holy name but also saw the depiction of his body all over the place and had a double consolation for his loss. Images, holy images and finger rings and seals and cups to call to memory. This holy individual. So that one would not just hear that holy name, but also see the depiction of his body all over the place. St. John Chrysostomos, the golden mouth, one of the greatest Greek church fathers ever. One of the greatest early church fathers, one of the very best orators. You've got to really stop and examine this and really say, wow, this is incredible. Now, I know people are going to stop and say, what about the Dura Europa synagogue? And there's no argument. We we hearken to that third century Dura Europa synagogue, but we're particularly looking at the patristic evidence, actually being able to nail down names of early church fathers. I know there's evidence of Gnostic texts or what have you. I don't like looking at heterodox documents and trying to to build a case through heretical groups the way Protestants have to do. We can stick with the Orthodox early church fathers. We'll leave the heretics to the Protestants because they uh, seem to have uh, fun identifying with them. They identify with them a little bit better. But uh, it should speak volumes when the fathers who we're examining and we're seeing here are very clearly titans of the faith. Magnificent early church fathers. Now, blessed the honor of Cyrus uh, is one you rarely hear about. Now, of course, he's not as prominent as the others. You don't hear about him as often as the others. But it's still quite significant in that it is, he says, it is said that the man, St. Simeon, became so celebrated in the great city of Rome that at the entrance of all of the workshops, men have set up small representations of him to provide thereby some protection and safety for themselves. Life of St. Simeon the Stylite. Now, the one thing that we're going to notice as we go on and on through this examination, there is incredibly important historical information. We have to emphasize how massively important this is. The fact that there is historical information 
that the Assyrian Church of the East, which we believe broke out even before the Oriental Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox as well, venerate images. So mega scholars even note that the existence for the use of icons is plentiful in the Assyrian Church of the East, continuing well into the 14th century. Although the Assyrian Church does not currently make large use of icons, but they are indeed present in our tradition. So you find examples even brought out through here. There's multiple examples. The theological thought of the patristic. So we're not done with the patristic testimony. We're going to even look at testimonies brought forth by uh, the Oriental Orthodox. You have the Acts of Marmari. And we'll read what the historical documentation has to say. First, we'll begin with the oldest testimony to prove that images exist in the Acts of Marmari. We find the account of the correspondence between King Agbar the Black and Christ. Now, of course, we recognize this is likely legendary. There's no argument that it isn't, but it's still early, and it still shows the testimony of the positive utilization of images. Agbar, according to the Acts of Mar, Mari the Apostle, is the king of Edessa during the time of Christ. He hears of this Judean king and sends emissaries to receive his message and depict his appearance. Notice the way icons are introduced. He admired and was amazed by the might of God, since he was not worthy of seeing these things. He found skill painters and ordered them. Okay, so really, really, I, I got to really emphasize, pay attention to everything here. Pay attention to the historical context. He says then, since he was not worthy of seeing these things, he found skill painters and ordered them. To depict the fact of our Lord and bring the depiction to him, the face of our Lord. The painters were not able to depict the Lord's human appearance. When our Lord realized, thought the understanding of his divinity, the love of Agbar for him, and he saw the painters who endeavored to find the image to depict him as he was, but failed. He took a cloth and imprinted on it his face. The cloth was placed in the church of Edessa, where it still remains as a source of all kinds of help. The East Syrian Acts of Mari is a legendary account of the first Christianization of Mesopotamia, more specifically of the region around the capital of the Persian Empire, Seleucia, or in modern terms, central Iraq. A number of observations by the anonymous author may be valid for a later period, sometimes as late as a period when the acts were put into writing. For the present study, there are two fragments. The first is from Eusebius of Caesarea who confirms in his book that he had seen the statue of Christ when he stayed in Caesarea Philippi. The second is a fragment of the story of the Mandilian as one of the earliest East Syriac witnesses, which will be used to legitimize, legitimize the veneration of images in our churches. According to Christian tradition, the image of Edessa was a holy relic consisting of a square or rectangle of cloth upon which a miraculous image of the face of Jesus had been imprinted. The first icon image which is generally known as a Mendelian. By the way, uh, very proud that Harak, our co-author of our book on transubstantiation, has done tons of research in this particular area. He is an expert when it comes to images. I, I think before we hop on over to looking at more evidence within Oriental Orthodoxy, Syriac, Orthodoxy and the Assyrian Church of the East in venerating images and icons. Uh, before we head that way, I think it will be quite important to look at uh, a figure that you don't hear of very often when it comes to iconography images, that being the great Saint Cyril of Alexandria. Now, what comes to mind when we think of Saint Cyril? Number one, you think of the great Christologists of all time. You think of the great St. Ignatius of Antioch. You think of the great St. Irenaeus. <clears throat> and on and on, the great St. Athanasius of Alexandria. The great St. Basil. So many others. Great masters of Christology. Defenders of the Holy Trinity. But of course, you also think of that master defender of transubstantiation. Defender of St. Mary as Theotokos. That master of Christology, St. Cyril of Alexandria, whose masterful Christology was front and center at Ephesus 431. Now, he's not the only one you think of. When you think of masters of Christology, you also think of the great Pope St. Leo the Great, the lion. 
the warrior for the faith whose tome of Chalcedon was front and center there at Chalcedon 451. You think of both of these as masters of Christology. Really, really, it does come down to that. So what a significant figure who provides for us an incredible insight when he says, even if we make images of pious men, it is not so that we might adore them as gods, but that when we see them, we might be prompted to imitate them. And if we make images of Christ, it is so that our minds might wing aloft in yearning for him. Now, how incredible is this? You have, I want to add a very important point. And I want you to meditate upon it. These fathers whose writings we are reading, when we <clears throat> examine, by the way, there are many more examples. These are the ones that I thought to be the best. When we meditate upon who these figures are, you know, which what fathers are we reading of? Why are they important when we meditate upon their the identities of these fathers? We meditate upon who they are. <clears throat> These are titans of the faith. These are what I like to call patristic pillars. These are giants of the faith, masters of the faith, warriors of the faith. And I have got to tell you, I am absolutely blown away at the evidence before us. St. Cyril cannot be ignored because he is a master of the faith, a master defender of the faith. And when we look in his, his, his writing here, he's very clear, even if we make images of pious men, so you can make images of saints, of holy men, because that's what he's saying. If we make images of pious men, give me one second. You always have to double check and triple check everything in the pathologia uh, to make sure that you've got a, an authentic work. Omoyoma, to Christu. Now, now, here's the one thing, uh, as I've pointed out multiple times, uh, the necessity, and yes, I, I don't own all of the Patrologia in PDF format. I'd love to. Uh, I own a, a massive amount of it in, in, uh, in Logos, but uh, unfortunately, St. Cyril's editions are not available there, so you got to hop on, on over to Google Books and look at it and double check and make sure the Greek lines up as best as you can uh, in order to verify that it is authentic. Once you do verify it's authentic, you should do this for all work. If you're going to be trying to do scholarly work, you should be able to access the databases. Now, I know not all the fathers are available in the Patrologia. I know not all of them are available. That is something very important. Uh, but a massive, a good amount are. The others, you, you might end up having to purchase additions, like uh, we had to purchase a critical edition of St. Romanos. Very important figure. He will figure into this later on in this series. But uh, focusing upon what St. Cyril is saying, even if we make images of saints, of holy men, we're not doing it to adore them, to worship them as gods, but that when we see them, we might be prompted to imitate them. And if we make images of Christ, it is so that our minds might win the loft in yearning for him. This is precisely what is taught within the apostolic faiths. This is exactly what is taught. And St. Cyril's theology here is magnificent. Of course, I am going through St. Cyril of Alexandria's Expositio in Salmos, which unfortunately is not available in English. It has not been translated. So it's been fun going through it, having to see what he has to say about images. Um, but you got you got the gist of that. We now move on to, I think it's going to be fun to close out our examination here of the fathers. By the way, you may be saying, William, well, I thought you were going to look at all the fathers that Gavin brings up and rebut them. I am going to do that. You don't have to worry. That is going to be done. When is that going to be done? That is going to be done in the final series. I'm going to go through them each one point by point. But today we're looking at the positive evidence, and we have had great positive evidence. We have looked at what I would say is overwhelming early evidence, second century, 300s, fourth century, uh, and even on and on, third century as well. We are just, it's just mind blowing what we have had the opportunity to look at, to examine, 
I think the evidence is incredibly overwhelming. Now, right now, I want to emphasize again for for the the argument that this is an accretion. Um, and I know not everybody says, well, this propped up because of Nicaea 2. But I know the argument that Nicaea 2, well, Nicaea 2 happened and this really did explode, really doesn't hold water. Because as we pointed out, the Assyrian Church of the East and the Syriac Orthodox, they schismed off well before Nicaea 2, centuries before. So it doesn't fit that narrative, the only reason we can have all of these apostolic branches, all of these churches that have incredible apostolic pedigree, believing this very same thing in iconography is because it is apostolic, it is ancient, and we have the very roots of this in the Old Testament, as we have seen in part one. Thaw is why we can look at such, and this really is solemn. How fitting to close out the show, I think, by looking at Amazing ancient Syriac icons. Our Syriac brothers and sisters love iconography, the visitation of Mary. This really is incredible. This, this, a lot of these images I am looking at and seeing for the first time, they're just amazing. Wow. What do we think of when we think of the visitation of Mary? We think of uh, what comes to mind is uh, the exclamation of, of Saint Elizabeth. With, it's just really incredible. Her, her, the words are, are indicative of her greeting Holy Mary as the new Ark of the New Covenant, and of course the Annunciation, where the angel greets Mary as as Hail, Kyrik Charitomene, Hail, having been fully graced. Amazing, Annunciation Monastery of the Syrians. This is just gorgeous, and a lot, of, like I said, a lot of these images I am seeing for the first time with you. I have not seen a lot of these. They are incredible. They're ancient, incredible. So you would have, I, I brought up the Dura Europos synagogue before, and I think it is valid to bring up. Today, I've, I've tried focusing mostly on patristic material, figures whose names we can hammer down, and not only figures whose names we can hammer down, they're not obscure is what I thought to be the most important part. They are giants of the faith. They are patristic pillars, and I think that has been Perhaps one of the most important things that I have double, triple, and quadrupled down upon, and I really emphasize the Annunciation. A lot of people have seen artwork similar to this one. This is awesome. This is great. And uh, we'll likely conclude our show by going through a few awesome, gorgeous artwork. Slides, Syriac. Um, from the Syriac studies here, checking out a, a lot of these. This is really great. Uh, now, there's a ton here. I'll put a link down below to this. You can check it out. I am looking at the ones that I particularly am interested in. I want to check over. I want to check out um, uh, the wedding at Cana, uh, our Teotokos. I like this one. This is awesome. This is really, really neat. Wow. And and you really get the idea of how how precious this artwork is, as as you notice the gold around the the halo uh, representing uh, as as it was very common when they would do artwork of a very special saint to have that gold fill in really just emphasizes the importance of the particular saint being depicted. Awesome. This, this looks great. It looks very similar to a lot of modern ones. I, of course, this isn't modern, but a lot of modern ones try to, to copy a lot of these ancient ones. This one really does seem beat up. So unfortunate. We need to protect our icons. We need to protect them. And why do I think we need to protect them? Because they really, really are a window to a time where the church really just was so... Uh, in love of the faith, and it really should, when we're going through tumultuous times, call us to recognize that the church has gone through tumultuous times, tumultuous periods before, and has never, never wavered. This is me. The wedding at Cana, this is the one I want to check out. That's awesome. The wedding at Cana. Uh, the sure does look to me like that is becoming wine. It's turning water into wine. That is awesome. So this is preserved in the British Library. That is so cool. 
Now, if you're watching this, it's pulling up a, a delicious drink. Maybe you're drinking a beer right now, or maybe you're drinking a coffee, or maybe you're drinking a Coke or a Diet Coke, or, or as my brother Gary, uh, uh, Dr. Pepper. You're, you're truly, really loving this. How fun to be able to be here with you as we premiere this. And if you notice, this is very clearly artwork depicting our Lord and Savior Christ, right? Side by side with St. Mary. Awesome. There are many more, and if you want to check them out, I'm going to post a link. I'll post a link down below. You can check it out. Go to the site. The Last Supper. I want to look at this one. And then we will go to our concluding thoughts. Have a little bit more things to read. <clears throat> By no means are we even remotely close to finishing this series. In a few moments, I will be meeting with mega scholar. Mega, 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 mega scholar. <laughs> On the Council of Elvira, we're going to get to talk about the canons of Elvira and you will get insight into the Council of Elvira that you perhaps have never known about. Again, that full edition interview will be exclusive to patrons, but a clip of it will be included in my presentation that I'm giving rebutting Dr. Ortland. I thank my patrons so much for everything you've done for us. Everything you've done, you are the reason we are able to produce the material we can produce. As many people know, a lot of the material we produce requires us to purchase very expensive books. So we're not becoming rich upon doing any of this. A lot of the times, a lot of us are barely breaking even because of the material we have to purchase. So please consider becoming a patron. The link is down there below. It allows us to do what we do, to purchase artwork that we use for our books, to purchase books that we need, to provide translations for you. Always consider becoming a patron. There are tons of perks that I offer. I think I offer a lot more than anyone else when it comes to perks, including gifts I send out, free eBooks, and I toss you into an exclusive WhatsApp group where I am a part of, and many other, of the, some of the top Catholic apologists in the world. Um, I think you really like it. But let's focus back on this. For people that cannot support via Patreon, guess what? You can support me with your prayers. That is gold. That is gold. This is awesome artwork on the Last Supper. Awesome artwork on the Last Supper. Wow. Especially like it. This is just great, great stuff. Of course, we also encounter a few comments that I, I'm thrilled to be able to get the opportunity to read as we round out this uh, edition. The Book of Treasures, and, and here we read a particular um, <clears throat> commentary that has been preserved by St. Jacob Bar Shako. Now, of course, we're reading of Syriac saints, figures that are quite prominent within Syriac orthodoxy, and his words are quite stunning. The Holy Church of Christ paints his life, his death, his passion, his resurrection, and his ascension. For Christ commanded his disciples to remember them. And many men, children, and women who do not learn about his earthly life from books, learn about it from the walls by the sign of the images. The church does not adore statues at all. We adore God. We salute the saints as servants of God and stewards of the Lord's treasures. Amazing, really, really amazing. We will conclude our session with meditating upon what St. Dionysius Jacob Bar Salibi says from the 12th century in his Treatise Against the Jews. The Israelites worshiped God by praying before the ark and not before boards or stones, just as we worship before painted icons and in front of the cross, not by adoring the painting or the wood, but by worshiping God. This is a great example. Great, great example. Really does hearken to the language of Psalm 137. 
really, really does. And we find that this theology of bowing down and calling to mind the saint or God and directing your prayer and your worship towards Almighty God or your prayer you're asking for intercession to the saint really is ancient. And I really do have to really be very careful that not only is this ancient, this is apostolic as it is shared by all of the apostolic churches. And again, I will conclude this session by saying, we're barely beginning. I hope you have enjoyed this thus far. There's a lot more to come.